Hey and welcome to Bike World. This week we're bringing you the show from Lakeside Harley Davidson because of this, the brand new HD Breakout. I'll be putting this through its paces later on in the show, but unfortunately for you guys, Susie is off sunning herself somewhere, so you're stuck with me. Here's what I've got lined up for you. We take an in-depth look at what's available in the world of Bluetooth headsets in Bike World on Tour. And we have a new section of the show in which we're going to bring you some awesome footage of the brand new KTM Duke 1290 in action, plus a video of what happens when Valentina Rossi has a play date. But first, it's time for us to get our hands dirty in the workshop with this old friend, R07 Plate Kawasaki ZX6R. Now, our aim was to turn this into the ultimate track tool, and we did get quite a bit of work done on the last series, but unfortunately for us, it's spent the last six months in the garage because we've been so busy. Now, we've managed to rope in one of our old friends and a good friend of the show, David, the chief technician from Gearlink Kawasaki, one of the leading British super sport race teams, to come and give up the once over. Okay, so David, now we've got a bit of a situation with our track bike where it's been in storage for pretty much almost a year now since we last did some work on it, but the checks we're gonna carry out today are pretty good checks for anyone to carry out a bike that either hasn't been on track before or hasn't been on track for a while, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's definitely key after after the bike's been stored for such a long time. It's like you need to check every single nut and bolt. Yeah. Um, just, just to make sure that when you go out on track, nothing's gonna work its way loose or nothing's already loose. David, actually quite glad we got you to uh, perform this check because you found something wrong with the bike, didn't you? I, I did indeed, yeah. Through on my checks, I found that your rear disc was warped. Um, now, how badly is that? Um, it's, it's enough to notice probably through riding. As I spin your back wheel, you can see the pads moving through throughout the duration of the disc. So I'd strongly recommend we change that before you do anything on track. Okay, so you've given a, a nuts and bolts check. Notice that the rear disc needed to be replaced. There was a bit of a wobble on that. You've also done the air filter and the oil filter and changed the oil. So it's pretty, you know, good little service you've done at the moment, David. Um, what's left to do? Right, well, we're, we're at a stage now where we can just start the bike up and just check the oil level, make sure the bike sounds good, and, and then you'll be ready to roll. So, considering that's the first time she's been starting up in Angra for, I think, almost two years, and it's been sitting in the garage the whole time, I was quite impressed with how she sounded. I was very impressed as well. She, did, she was very crisp. Yeah, yeah. Good response. Yeah, she, she sounds good, no rattles, no... Well, she did everything she was supposed Let's to do. do. Yeah, yeah, she's purring. And now, that's pretty much us done for today. Thank you so much for your help as well, David. Well, it's always good to be able to call upon the current leading super sport uh, chief technician to come and work on my track bike. Um, but, but what would you recommend as the next things to do? Because we've done, as I mentioned at the start, you know, chains, sprockets, tyres, we've done so much, there, there's not a long way to go, is there? There's not a long way to go. If you wanted a little bit more performance, I'd probably recommend like, some fuel and injection unit. Yeah. Um, and it, that, that will basically just give you a little bit more torque, a bit more horsepower. It's a decent power commander, and it'll mm -hmm. allow you to, as you say, modify it a little bit for each track as well. Yes, yes, it would, yeah. yeah. And then just uh, the rest of... The rest of what you can change is just on the chassis. Like yeah. You can um, like a, a, a aftermarket rear shock and yeah. like maybe some fork internals. It'll just give you a better a better range to work with. And yeah. Okay. So if I so think about suspension, maybe exhaust as well, mm -hmm. power commander, a bit of steering damper. Steering damper. Yeah. 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 And then we're pretty much there on track. Just a new paint job. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to do it pink. The 2013 then, it's 
quite a big deal to Harley Davidson because it marks the 110th anniversary of the brand. And you know what? Harley Davidson during those years has completely dominated the cruiser market. But it's more than just a motorcycle brand. I mean, people around the world, even if they've never seen a motorcycle in the flesh, will have heard of a Harley. And to many, it's even more than that. It's a proper lifestyle, it's a passion. But the problem is, is in the last few years, there's been a few pretenders to their throne. While Harley have been doing their classic thing with the old style and the old technology, some new manufacturers have come in and pushed on, especially in the muscle cruiser category, things to the next level. Thing is, while Harley's rivals maybe took the technology game and stakes up a little bit, it caused a bit of an issue for Harley because they're all about tradition and classic designs and classic technology. So they couldn't just suddenly turn around and produce this new modern fangled bike without keeping some of that tradition and history involved. Enter the CVO breakout. This got launched back in 2012. Now, it was a whopping 22 to 24,000 pounds and only 17 made it to the UK. It was a sea of chrome and torque and it looked incredible, but Harley needed to make it a little bit more practical and a little bit more affordable. This year, they've done that by bringing out the 2013 breakout. And my goodness, have they got it right. Now, as we know from hanging around with the Bike Shed Motorcycle Club recently, Retro has never been so cool. And what Harley have done with the breakout is very, very clever. They brought a young design lead to come in and while retaining all the classic lines and looks and traditions of a Harley, make some subtle changes that just bring it up to date. Take the suspension for instance, now this is a Harley Softail. Traditionally that means that while it has a rigid swing arm look about it, it does have a couple of springs under the rear mudguard. Now, in the past I've got on a Harley Softail and after about two hours I have to get off because my back's actually crumbled, the ride has been that bad. But combined with a really comfy seat on the breakout, they have made some tweaks to the suspension that honestly make this one of the best riding Harleys I've ever been on. And you can see the design leads input in the way the bike actually looks. Gone are the pure chrome exhaust with a weird kind of matte finishing on them. Now, it's taken me a while to get used to it, but I quite like it. The big mag wheel at the front, again, really has grown on me. The only thing I would make a big change to when it comes to the front end of the bike is you've got these massive chrome bits where the forks are and a tiny little headlamp. It looks a bit weedy. But one thing I've done brilliantly with this bike is they have made it low. It looks like a proper drag strip racer. And don't get me wrong, it's long but my goodness, it's mean. And it's only accentuated by the flat handlebars and low seating position, because trust me, when you're sitting on this and you pull up at the lights, you really do feel like a drag racer. Something Harley Davidson have always had, I suppose, in the bank over their rivals is build quality. And that's something that the breakout doesn't let you down on. This bike is beautifully put together. And I'm not just talking about the overall finish. I'm talking about every little detail, every bolt, every piece of chrome, every braided hose, it's just put together beautifully and the bike looks like a work of art. And of course you have the added advantage of a Harley Davidson in as much that yes, it looks beautiful when you ride it out of the showroom in pristine condition, but you know what, it's still pretty much going to look that way in two years time, no matter how hard you've ridden it. Now one gripe I've had in the past with Holly Davidson's is their stopping power. Normally on a cruiser, especially one that you buy in the UK, you'd expect double sided front disc brakes. On a Harley, you only have to have one. Now with a breakout, ABS does come as standard and while the brakes may not be as scary as some of the Harleys in the past, they still don't have that bite that I'd like when I'm on a bike that weighs 320 kilos. Something they have got absolutely spot on though is the chassis. Now with the 240mm back profile and a bike as long as what well, it seems about as long as a double decker bus, you think that this thing can go around corners as well as an iceberg. But that's the biggest surprise. With all the weight low down and for some reason the geometry of the bike just all works and it tips in beautifully. It is the smoothest cornering Harley Davidson I've ever ridden. But this brings me on to a bit of a gripe. Now it may seem minor, but the pegs. Why make a bike that can go beautifully round corners and then restrict it to a 22 degree lean angle because you've got pegs that are really low on it? Don't get me wrong, you feel like a hero going around every corner scraping your pegs, but as my mate said to me once, well that's great until you get one caught in a drain or in a pothole and you end up making a very expensive mess of your Harley Davidson. Now it would be impossible not to mention the rear end of the breakout. It is one sexy behind. Yes, it's got a 240mm back tyre like my old Hammer did, but there's something about the way the soft tail just sits over the frame of that tyre that just looks wicked. Now let's talk about one of the big stars, the engine. They've put a 103 cubic inch, which is a 1690cc V-twin in there, producing 96 pounds for the torque. Now, that's considerably down on its rivals. The Thunderbird Storm produces 115 pounds for the torque and the Hammer S 113 pounds for the torque. 
but it's still enough to give it some go. And the great thing about this engine is the way it delivers it. It truly is smooth, progressively working through the torque curve and not as snatchy as some of the other muscle cruisers that we're used to. So while it may not be as much of a hooligan as some other muscle cruisers, it really does allow you to work the engine for a very smooth gearbox and probably match them in performance stakes. So we're talking about a Harley engine here with loads of character, and I'm not just talking about the traditional kind of bobbery character, we're talking about one with real performance, an engine that really wants to be ridden. Another great thing about the engine is the noise it makes. Now, the standard cans don't really do it justice, but if you put on some aftermarket cans for about a grand 1,500 pounds, it will sound spectacular and exactly how you imagined it should do. Price-wise, the breakout starts at 15699 which is much more expensive than its rivals, but you've got to take into account the build quality, the reliability, the dealer network, and the fact Harley's actually retain value. I'll give you one example. We chatted to a guy who had one of the 17 CVO breakouts in the country earlier, and while he bought the bike for £22,000, before he'd even taken delivery of it, someone had offered him 44000 for it. So not only was he getting a bike he's going to have a lot of fun on, but it was actually turning out to be a rather sweet investment. So I can't believe I'm saying this about Harley-Davidson. They have made not just a brilliant HD, but a very good bike. And the first Harley-Davidson I would recommend as a rider's bike. But something interesting happening in a few weeks' time, there's an Indian coming out. So from one workshop to another, we're now at PH Motorcycles here in Crawley because of this, our Triumph Explorer camera bike. Now you might remember in the first segment of Bike World on Tour, we had some Triumph OE panniers fitted. So now we've got somewhere safe to store all our equipment. The next step in turning this into the ultimate adventure touring bike is to look at communication. Now as you can imagine, when filming a TV show about motorbikes, it's kind of important to have communication between the director and the vehicle in front and the presenter on the motorcycle behind to ensure that we get the best shot. What are you waiting for? Over the years, we've developed a number of kind of natural hand signals to allow the director to tell me what to do on the bike. These will be speed up, it could be this for slow down, and of course, then there's the internationally renowned symbol for I've left my indicator on. And nowadays, it's not just about rider-to-rider -rider communication, but also allowing you as a rider to communicate with your smartphone or tablet device. The reason being, you might want to hear your sat-nav directions, listen to the radio, or even screen and answer phone calls while riding. So we thought we'd best go about sorting ourselves out with a Bluetooth communication set that would suit our specific needs. Now, there are a number of popular headsets on the market. Uh, one to look out for is the Senna SMH10. That's very popular due to its ease of use, durability, and it's a bit of a bargain. If you ride in a larger group, the Chatterbox XBI2H could be the one for you, as that allows up to 16 riders to be connected at once. But after lots of deliberation, we decided to go with the Interphone F5 XT, along with the SMI phone smartphone holder. Now, the reason being, we have a few very specific needs. First up is range. Not only are we often out filming all day throughout cities in heavy traffic, but I'm rubbish at following directions and often get lost. Therefore, we need a bigger range as possible and the Interphone F5 XT has the largest range, 1.3 kilometers between two paired headsets. But what's cool about this as well is the more headsets you add to it increases the range exponentially. Now that's brilliant if you ride with three or four people like we often do on a group test. Another really important thing for us is battery life. Obviously we go out riding all day and we're chatting all the time, so we need a device that is not going to run out after a couple of hours. Luckily the F5 XT has the largest battery life out of all of its rivals and this is because it utilizes Bluetooth 3.0, giving you a whopping 11 hours of talk time and 700 hours of standby time, which is very handy in case I forget to switch the unit off at night, but the next morning it will still be working my boss won't have a go at me. Another great feature this has is text-to-speech. Now, most Bluetooth headsets communicate with you, letting you know which mode they're in and what's going on by a series of beeps, but this is very clever. It will actually tell you which mode it is in. It will also screen your calls and tell you who is calling you. Very handy if you want to avoid a certain someone mostly my mum. It's also got eight presets for radio and excellent stereo speakers that give you really good audio quality. But one of my favourite things and something that is really essential to the filming of Bike World is this. It actually has a little remote control you can fit on the handlebars, which means when you're riding along, you're not trying to fiddle with the headset on the side of your helmet, which, as you can imagine, can ruin a long shot that might have taken ages to set up. Now, obviously, one of the key features of the F5 XT is its ability to pair with the smartphone. But if your smartphone is you know, sitting away in your pocket, well, you're losing nearly all of its functionality. 
So we went with the SMI phone holder because this allows, in this case, our iPhone to not only be on full display, so we're getting all the visual functionality, but even with your gloves on, it allows you to operate the touch screen. Plus, it keeps it completely waterproof and the SMI phone holder will fit on any set of handlebars. Now when it comes to fitting, it really is a doddle, and trust me, that's coming from me. When it comes to the headset itself, you've got two options. You can either attach it with a permanent sticker, or if in our case you might want to change it between helmets, there's a really nice little clamp which just secures with a couple of screws. To put the speakers in the actual helmet itself, you just remove the lining, and most helmet manufacturers nowadays even leave a space specifically for speakers of this type. And then it just comes down to choosing your microphone. If you've got a full face lead, you can get one that just sticks inside, but if you're a bit more of a show-off like our director and want to look a bit more like Madonna during her Vogue era, then you can use one of these microphones that comes out on a wire designed for an open face helmet. Now when it comes to fitting remote control, it genuinely couldn't be easier. It is just two screws that go in the back and exactly the same on the SMI phone holder as well. Now obviously this setup is designed with our specific needs in mind and yours will probably be completely different, but don't fret, Interphone do an absolute shed load of official accessories, add-ons and things that allow you to customise and change your setup to how you like it. Price wise, the Interphone F5 XT will set you back 299 for a pair of Bluetooth headset devices with microphones and everything you need to get started. Plus the SMI phone holder is £44. Now that is at the slightly more higher end of the scale, but for under £350 we have got ourselves a complete communication solution. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be putting it through its paces in some rather ingenious ways to find out just how good it is. Welcome to a brand new segment of the show in which we're going to bring you all the coolest motorcycle videos from around the world. First up, Dionysia have sent us this, and it's what happens when Valentino Rossi invites a couple of friends around to have a play in his back garden. It's like a dream from when you are a child, no? You hope that at one moment you can buy your own racetrack. Around three years ago, we find this place that is very close to Tavuglia, very close to my house. We build every corner. This track is something special. I grew up riding motorcycle. It's my passion. You have always uh, trying to improve your skills and also trying different things. MotoGP, motocross, flat track. Coming here alone, uh, never. Always ride with friends. È un idolo e girare oggi con lui è, per me è come un, un sogno. Sono troppo contento. Sono come un bambino. Ross is legend, isn't he? What more can you say? And still so far, this I think they're playing. So I'm very curious to see what's happened. Thomas from the Super Motard, a guy from the TT, very high level rider, but coming from another place, you know? We were just driving down from the top of Tavulia down here and you could see it. And I thought, what is it? Is it a tarmac track? It's hell of a size, isn't it? I don't know, so I don't know, I've been on a terrain like this. We'll see how it works. It's different than all the other tracks. The grip level is very low, a percentual of concrete that is very stable, but at the same time is also dirt. I went straight into road racing at 19 year old, so I haven't got much of an off-road background really. But it's always good, any bike riding me, I don't bother, I just want to go ride a motorbike. Everybody have great fun to ride this track. All the riders stop with a big laugh. And loads of lads in motorbiking, you know, speedway lads, motocross lads, flat track lads. We're all singing the same shape. We just want to go and ride a motorbike. During the summer, we always make races, so we have to understand which one is the best. I think I'm faster, yeah, because I have more experience in this place. I don't know. I don't know. So, I'll say more. The taste to go at the limit is the same than the first day. I think the passion to have fun when you ride is the most important thing.
Now, probably the most anticipated bike of 2013 is the KTM Duke 1290, AKA the Beast. We cannot wait to get our hands on this bike, but it's not coming out till later in the year. Luckily for us though, we managed to get our footage on what happened when it was debuted for the first time here in the UK, when Jeremy McWilliams rode it up the hill at the Festival of Speed. That's it for this week's show. Set your reminders for the next one, which will take place on Thursday, the 22nd of August at 9 p.m. In the meantime, if you want more exclusive Bike World content, don't forget to like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to our YouTube channel.